Hey y'all, it's the one and only True Review right here with another top 10 for you. And today we're continuing from the last top 10's theme on how well or badly a game has aged. But this time we have the top 10 best games that aged really well. The rules for this are, each game must be at least 10 years old, still hold up to today's market, no puzzle games as most of them can stand the test of time on their own and having them on here isn't going to be fair for the rest of the world's gaming library, Graphics doesn't count as a valid reason once again, and finally, I know I've said it before but it needs saying again, this list has only room for 10 games, so not every game will get mentioned here. So with all that said, let's hit it once more! Fallout 2! Whether you're a fan of the Bethesda titles, the Interplay originals, or if you just like all of them, you have to admit that there is a huge difference between the first few Fallout games and every game since that started with Fallout 3. Like many today, I started out on the Bethesda side of it all, playing Fallout 3, New Vegas, and 4. But it was only after playing those did I decide to check out the original games, and I have to say, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed those games. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that I adore Fallout 1 and 2. But though my personal favourite of the two is Fallout 1, I will admit that number 2 is the better game. Though some may be put off by its dated looks, though if we're going to talk about graphics then I'd argue that it's still alright, you will inevitably be surprised at just how much content this game holds. Tons of different and unique locations are all scattered about the map, each crammed with so many main and side missions to complete. And then there's just wandering around the place and coming across some weird shit, like the Bridge of Death gag that references Monty Python. This game also offers you a level of freedom that most games nowadays don't even consider offering you. With every decision that is presented to you, there's about three right ways of doing it, and about a hundred wrong ways of doing it. However, what's right is what works. You can try and make a deal with a Mafia boss by talking to him, or you could just kill him and take all of his stuff, or you could kick down the front door and shoot up the place, or you could just hire someone else to kick down the door and shoot up the place. Or failing that, you can sleep with both his wife and his daughter separately, mind you, not at the same time, we've got to draw the line somewhere. And then listen to them mumble the code to a nearby safe in their sleep, steal everything inside, and then run out snickering to yourself. I genuinely believe that if this game came out today as it is, then it'd be seen as a throwback to late 90s gaming, but with tons of interesting and exciting things thrown in. Also, the atmosphere is awesome. Thief the Dark Project The first game in the franchise, Thief the Dark Project was an ambitious title that managed to pull off everything it set out to do, and to a surprisingly good result as well. What you have to realise is that this came out when the stealth genre wasn't really a big deal back then, as most games that came out that featured a first person perspective were all shooters or something along those lines. But even looking back at that game nowadays, I still find myself thinking fondly of how good the gameplay was, and still is. Each map was massive, which would inevitably lead the player into some interesting scenarios. For example, while in the city, you could climb up a building, run along the rooftops, climb into some random nobleman's house, stop to check to see where you're at on the map, seeing as you are in what you think to be a safe zone, to only then realise that a guard has walked into the back of you upon returning to the main game. Once again, the amount of choice and options open to you are astounding here, offering you options that are just not present in modern day gaming. Rope arrows, for example, will allow you to climb up onto any structure that has wooden beams on it. And this can lead you to certain areas that I'm convinced were never intended to be accessed by the developers. It's like the attitude of this game is, if you can do it, then do it. While nowadays we would never be able to do any of that, what with invisible walls and insta-death zones that discourage us from exploring the unexplorable. Also, the atmosphere is awesome. Wait, I've said that before. Dungeon Keeper 2! A game I grew up with, so it's best if I take the nostalgia goggles off for a sec. Nope, it's still awesome. Dungeon Keeper 2 was a game from a genre that I'm not usually that interested in playing, but ended up loving it completely. I think what made this different from, say, your Age of Empires or your Command and Conquers is that the one designing the map isn't really the developer, but instead you, the player. 
Though there will be some sections you don't have a say over, how you want the map to look will entirely depend on how you shape it. Want to construct a room? Well then dig out your desired area and then build what you need. Oh no, enemies are coming and I want to create a death trap for them. Well then, dig out a corridor that leads to your dungeon heart and fill it with a f ton of traps. And then there's other things that feel as if they were there purely because the developers thought they'd help out the player. Your creature's not doing a good enough job in battle? Then possess one of them and fight in first person. I've got a room but I don't want anyone to go in it. Then build a door and lock it. One of my minions is pissing me off but I don't want to get rid of it or have it get angry because of X, Y and Z. Well, you could just pick them up and drop them in the torture chamber and keep them forever constantly topped up on health until you've satisfied your sadistic cravings. I've done that before in a bar demon, by the way. Well, what about if you like building dungeons, but don't want to be under pressure from invading enemies? Then go play My Pet Dungeon, which just lets you build the dungeon of your dreams. There's so much here. Leveling up of creatures, micromanagement, resource gathering, scouting, designing the map, trap and door manufacturing, spell researching and upgrading, capturing, torturing, converting, or even sacrificing of enemy and friendly units. And there's even a casino that plays Disco Inferno if someone wins. I never asked for that last part, but I'm damn glad that it's in there. This game has so much to offer that most RTS games don't nowadays, and it's a shame that the franchise died because of everything it brought to the table. However, on a quick note, War for the Overworld does bring all this back and an insane amount more, so go play that if you're still craving that Dungeon Keeper experience. Lane Goodman. Seven. Command and Conquer Red Alert 2 I'm probably not the best person to talk about why this game is on this list because for some reason I can't really give you a single answer as to why this game stood the test of time in my opinion, but there's just something fun about this game that makes me look at it, even now, and go, hey, this is still a good game, even taking modern games into account. This may come down to several factors, such as a memorable, lengthy and satisfying campaign, the easy to set up multiplayer, and the alternative reality scenario of the Cold War turning into a hot one, considering that many of us alive today were alive during the Cold War. And there was none of this crap like, the West are the underdogs fighting back against a powerful evil enemy that the Call of Duty franchise loves doing. Nope, you could play as either the Allies or the Soviet Union, and either side was just as bad as the other. I personally always sided with the Soviet Union because I prefer their stuff. Um, in the game that is. Not in real life, okay comrade? Stronghold Crusader! An RTS game that also includes castle management, as well as creating and protecting a very fragile economy... ...that's set in the Crusader States. Sold! Bloody sold! In most RTS games, if you wanted to train up a unit, then you build a barracks or something along those lines, select the unit that you want out of the pool available, and then wait for a few seconds and done. The Stronghold series takes a look at that formula and tells it to fuck off. Instead, if you wanted to get a knight to fight for you, then you first need to attract some peasants. Now, peasants need food, so you're going to have to build some wheat farms, but only where there's grass because you can't cultivate a desert. But wait, you have no wood to build this farm, so you hire some woodcutters first. Then you can go ahead and build that farm. But now all we've got is wheat, so you need to build a mill. But now we've got flour, so it's time to build a bakery. That's great and all, but your peasants don't want to just eat bread and nothing else. So you build some orchards and maybe a dairy farm. Great, you've now got a variety of food. Okay, so now go ahead and build your barracks and armory, because we need a place for these soldiers to rally, as well as a place to store our weapons. Oops, you need stone to build a barracks. So you build a stone quarry on some stone, as well as some ox carts to haul all of this back to your stockpile. So now we can go ahead and build the barracks and... It looks like we need to develop some swords and armor. So you build a blacksmith's and an armorer. Oops, need iron to make these items. So you build smelters upon some iron deposits. Sire, the people are unhappy and there are no more peasants to operate our new buildings. So you build some hovels to house new peasants, a church to make them religiously satisfied, more farms because our settlement has grown. Shit, the enemy is closing in, so it's time to build some walls around the keep, which in turn requires more stones, so you build some more quarries. More wood is needed for that, so you construct some more woodcutters huts. Okay, now we've got some swords, some armor, and a surplus of peasants, so let's finally recruit that knight- Nope, need money. 
See, it tax your population, and that makes them unhappy. So it's more churches, as well as some hop farms that will produce hops, a brewery to turn that into beer, and then finally a tavern to let them get drunk in. And only then can we now hire that one knight. And after hiring that single knight, does it occur to you that in order to get just one knight, we've had to build a mega fortress out in the desert. Now ask yourselves this. Why are the games nowadays are that in depth? Yeah, I didn't think so. Because after all, God wills it! God wills it! World of Warcraft! Say what you want about this game, but ever since it came out all those years ago, it is still the single biggest and most played MMORPG of all time. Its player statistics alone speak for itself as to how this game has aged. Many MMOs have come out since, and none of them have been able to knock WoW off its title of single most played online RPG ever. Which just goes to show how well it's aged. If it wasn't as good as it is, then people wouldn't play it. They'd do whatever, get bored, and then move on to the next one. Yet there are still thousands of players out there who have dedicated themselves to this game, and this game alone, when it comes to MMORPGs. It has one of the biggest in-game maps of all time, has an insane amount of content and quests to do, and don't forget that this game came from the same developers that made the Diablo series. The best gaming series when it comes to droppable loot. It has made such a mark on the gaming community, and is still widely played to this day, making it one of the longest active popular online games of all time. GTA San Andreas An absolute smash hit when it first came out, the San Andreas title would slowly find itself not really being talked about as the franchise went on. And I think this is partly in due to how well GTA 5 did, on top of how well that game improved on certain long-standing aspects about the franchise. But even going back to it recently, it still surprised me of what this game has to offer. Tons of side activities are about the place, including, but not limited to, heists and robbery missions, pimping missions, emergency service missions, flying missions, but f**k those. You can hijack valuable vehicles and then go and sell them to international buyers, take over Los Santos in a gang war, Decide that you've had enough with driving around and either break into an airport and steal a plane, or grab a jetpack and fly around Los Santos shooting ballers in midair. Or you could say screw it to all of that and just order two number nines, a number nine large, a number six with extra dip, etc, etc. Did you know that entire order comes out at just over 9,000 calories? It's amazing how Big Smoke hasn't had a heart attack by this point. Banjo-Kazooie! Try my best not to include any Nintendo games on this list, but I think I'll get away with this one. Banjo-Kazooie is one of those franchises that is still remembered well and loved even to this day. But even kindly asking the nostalgia to step out the room for a minute, we're still left with a charming platformer that holds up even to now. The two main characters offer diversity to the gameplay, allowing us to mix up attacks, as well as allowing us to traverse the otherwise untraversable. It's incredible, however, that this game was able to offer a level of charm and wit that no other game to this day has ever come close to, including this series' very own sequels. The likes of Super Mario 64 has stood the test of time, but I'd go so far as to say that Banjo-Kazooie stands right up there with it. Deus Ex! One of the best games of all time, Deus Ex was successful in creating a massive fan base and following when it first came out that still exists strongly today. And who can blame them when you consider how much choice and freedom this game has to offer in a uniquely bleak and dying futuristic dystopia? What I love about this game is that if there's something you're having difficulty with, or if there's a section that you just can't seem to get past, then I can assure you that there's another way of getting around it. Don't have the password to get past a particular door? Well, there's probably an office nearby that has it. Or I'm betting there's an air vent somewhere that'll let you bypass it altogether. Or even a data pad that tells you what the code is. Or maybe a lockpick or multi-tool that'll let you hack it. Or maybe you've got some explosives with you and you can just blow up the bloody thing instead. 
What's even better is that you can take this attitude towards the game itself, and it's like the developers have thought of every possible outcome and have a cutscene for it ready. And the story will be affected as a result. Need to get past Anna Navara? Well, you could fight her, or you could put some effort in and search for her kill phrase which will let you kill her in a conversation. Or hell, you could even not put the effort in at all by running past her and slamming the door in her face. Boss done. Hell, even going into the ladies' bathroom gets noticed by the game, as your boss tells you off for doing it. Everything has been thought of here, and it truly feels as if everything around you is affected by what you're doing. Something of which almost all games to this day do not do. Uh, apart from the rest of this series, that is. Unreal Tournament! The number one best game of all time, at least according to me. Unreal Tournament 1, the Game of the Year edition, offers so much in terms of gameplay to gamers of today that I'd go so far as to say that it's still a lot better than most modern day games. Even if we were to bring graphics back into the room for a second, they're not terrible! It's still possible and would be considered a retro shooter if it come out today. But even putting that aside, there are so many game modes, all of which are customizable, a crazy number of maps, a huge arsenal of weapons available to you, all of which have alternative firing modes that gives each weapon a different function, with each weapon being perfectly balanced, even the Redeemer which fires slow and compass the nuclear warheads, customizable skins, in-game modding, something of which has almost been totally removed from modern gaming, an awesome and psychedelic soundtrack that fits perfectly with the aesthetics of the game, there's even a story if you wanted to get invested in it or not. What's good about this game is that it's easily accessible to both old and new players, with easy to pick up and use weapons that can either be of some use in the hands of those who don't know what they're doing, or lethal in the hands of someone who knows how to use it. This game has provided me with a gaming experience that most games since then haven't been able to deliver. With the exception of Unreal Tournament 2004 and 3, and possibly Quake 3, Unreal Tournament Game of the Year is possibly the single greatest game that has stood the test of time and even goes so far as to give other games of the current generation a bad name. And for that reason alone, Unreal Tournament 1 deservedly claims the number one title on this list. And we're done, but if you've been giving other games a bad name, then like this video and subscribe as always. Remember that I'm on Twitter under the channel's name, where you can find out which video is up next, and all of the latest news and updates, and I'm also on Patreon if you'd like to support this channel further. And with that, I'm done. Uh, see ya!